Hi everyone. In this particular demo, we're going to be creating our own brushes. We're going to use PNG and ABR type files that you could search Google high res watercolor brushes. And these are the files and images that usually come up. Now, if you find some PNGs, you could use them just as they are. However, if you find ABR brushes, I'll show you how to convert those into PNGs. Many ABR brushes are even a set of brushes that will be able to extract all those files out of that ABR set and create PNGs into all of the individual brushes that were included in that ABR file. Now what we're going to do first is go over to our drawing board and I'm going to splash some traditional watercolor and paint around just to show you what kind of effects and brushes we're going to duplicate in a digital way. Let's get started. Okay, this is the picture we're going to paint from right here. And it's just going to be a basic tree scene. I have it up on another monitor. That's the one I'll be drawing from. And we're going to go ahead and draw it out and get started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to use my flat brush here. This is a Winsor Newton. This is the 995 series. I'm going to use it just to give a light gray wash of the sky. And then while it's wet, I'm going to go ahead and start putting in uh, just some burnt siennas, some oranges, uh, maybe a little bit of red, but they'll be diffused quite a bit. And they'll be very light just to start off, just a, a very soft edge uh, that will enhance uh, the foggy look of the picture itself. I'll go with the cobalt blue and just a little bit of burnt sienna. I'll gray it down. Then we can mix both of them up as is. It doesn't have to be a pure mixed color, obviously. And uh, burnt sienna, usually on the horizon line, gives a really nice winter effect. And then I'm also going to wet the paper down just a little bit just so it takes the wash real easy and that will also get me started in my foreground and more importantly background brush and trees okay that's it and then we got to remember now in traditional our colors will dry as much as 30 even sometimes 40 percent lighter than what you put them down uh, and that's not anything we have to worry about in digital. And then I'm going to just leave the colors like that a little bit on the not so perfectly mixed side, just so I could take some in and I'll just take it the whole way across. I'd like to keep a bead going the whole way across, but this is such a small painting. I don't think we'll have to do that. Okay, that's it. And I'm going to let that orange glow there. Now I'm going to grab a squirrel brush. That would be this one right here. And I'm going to wait for this to dry up just a little bit. It's a little bit too wet right now. I don't want, I want the colors to bleed, uh, but not a whole bunch to where it totally diffuses my shape. I just want a soft shape and not necessarily uh, completely blurred out to where you can't even make out what it is. Now we're going to mix up. Okay, let's grab some orange. A little bit of, let's go with the quinacridone gold. One of my favorite colors. Mixes well with everything. And then these here are the uh, burnt sienna and brown matter, but then uh, these are the uh, real reds and then the cobalt violet might even be a nice color too. I can barely see my pencil drawing now, but that's okay. Because these will all be lighter colors. And then I'm also going to just start my... There will be obviously darker greens you could see up in the sky area. But then we're going to keep some lighter greens down in here. And that will be either the arelin and yellow and then maybe some blues. Uh, they give the real end works really well with uh, blues to make a really nice green. I 
Okay, and as the paper starts to dry, then I'll put in more and more darker colors and let them bleed out a little bit, but they'll just get more and more pronounced. And then once I get all my yellows, oranges, and burnt siennas in, then I'm going to start putting in the distant pine trees. And this painting will change quite a bit with the drying of the paper. Get a little bit smaller brush. We're going to go with a pure red. We'll tone it down a little bit with orange, but then what we'll do is this will be for the distant. This will be for the uh, distant blueberries in fall. And I'll keep the lay of the land. And the blueberries are only up here on top in the fields. I'll wait, wait till that dries a little bit. And then there's a rock slide right in here. Barely noticeable. Okay, and I'll put some real fine washes of just light blues and cobalt violets to get my stones started. And then we'll redefine them even further once it starts drying out. But these brushes, I'm only using this brush, I'm getting all kind of watercolor shapes here uh, just by turning this brush sideways and using it different ways. Now there are greens and deep golds in here, so I'm just going to let that run happen. But my point is, uh, just with one brush, I can make all kind of different shapes. And then once I get down into here, I'll splatter a little bit uh, just to get some real strong texture for the uh, vegetation that grows on the ground, the lichen, real short blueberries, a little bit of grasses. We're going to leave this dry here and we'll start putting in more and more details and we can start putting in our distant pine trees but then this foreground pine tree will be very last but it'll lighten up as it dries and this will be blocked in just to start us i'll go ahead and dry this with a hair dryer and we'll come back to it okay it's nice and dry uh, we'll go ahead and start putting in our distant pine trees and then work our way up that it'll get darker and darker as we come down into this uh, yellow branch from the pine tree. And then the rocks will make them uh, deeper and darker in certain areas. Right now, these are pretty much the lightest colors you'll see. And I left some pure white. I also left out this bottom bush right down in here. I was just gonna make it all rocks and then just a little bit of texture right in here. We can bleed it off and just leave the white of the paper in some places. This will just give us a rough idea what we're looking for when it comes to creating our digital brushes. Okay, I'm gonna go back to a smaller brush. This one right here, it's just a zero squirrel hair. And then we're gonna start mixing up just a little wee bit of the same green we used. We'll mix it way down with water. Remember, in traditional watercolors, we can always go darker, but it's pretty tough to go lighter. And this is all on one layer too, and no multiple layers. I'll mix that down with just a little wee bit more water. It'll dry up a little bit, but this is phthalo green. It's pretty strong. And then I could touch a little bit of regular green in some of them, but being that they're out in the distance, the blue shade will add to that. There's a couple here and there. Don't want them too close. Sometimes it's actually hard to make something random looking. Still might pick up an indirect pattern that just doesn't look natural. Now if I drop it down below the tree line, it'll be alongside the hill, the mountain, and I can make it darker because it will be closer. Uh, define a rock right there. And I'm getting such interesting organic shapes, just depending on how the brush touches down. Go back to the red for the blueberries. There, I just rinsed out the brush, 
And I'm just touching it down with some water, clean water in some places, just to leave a bleed in and diffuse some of my shapes. Other areas I might want a stronger edge that will define one plant from another, or even just to give it a little bit of snap here and there. And I want to touch down in some places, try not to keep on reworking the same areas over and over. Then I also want to do this, add darker colors where it's wet. That'll give it the classic watercolor look. And then if I get a little bit too dark towards the skyline, I'll just lift it out with my Kleenex. And oddly enough, that's why I have the Kleenex brush in my digital. And just say, for example, this is too dark. Just as an example, I'll scrub it out with water. If I don't want to disturb it too much, I'll spray it with water and then lift it back out. That's one of the few ways you can lighten something up. Now we're getting into some bigger trees, so I'll make the texture a little bit stronger and bolder colors. French ultramarine, really strong. What we'll start doing is to paint around our foreground pine branch. And then just a multiple layers of colors will make the painting more and more complex. Okay, we'll leave that dry. We'll start putting in the, the big pine tree just to see where we're at. And if you look real close, there's a, a real, I'll bring the picture up much bigger later, but there's a real whitish against the trunk. And just a quick footnote, that is actually what's called rime ice. And you can see it'll start about right in here and go up. And what that is is actually fog freezing to the tree, but it'll only start when the wind comes straight across these rocks. It'll only start from about here up, and the rest of the tree is protected down below the edge of the uh, boulders. And it's just a nice idea that I always want to know what I'm painting and what, what, what is that. Okay, let's leave this dry, and we'll come back and do some more refinements and start our pine tree. Okay, let's keep on working on this. I'll start some branches on the foreground tree, put in its trunk, but I wanted to put in some branches first because then what I'll do is paint the trunk around it so the trunk might not be just a solid line. It'll be broken up uh, just because it will be darker than the branches, so I always want to do my lighter colors first in a way. Let's try some greens. And again, we could always go, uh, go darker. This is just the tip of the brush. I'm getting some very unique shapes and they will be completely organic. And then I'm going to start with just this color green here and then I'll drop in some phthalo blue here and there and then maybe even put some yellows in here. but most of the yellows are on top. This is the shadowed side of the tree. And I could give some hints of branches in here too in some of these groups of pine needles. Looking back at my reference every now and then, I'll try and follow it here and there, but it doesn't have to be exact, obviously. There goes the distant tree. Well, this is still somewhat wet. I'm going to drop some deeper colors in. Leave them bleed. This is already drying up up here. I'll keep those pretty much on the bottom of each branch. And then this is where I would cover up the trunk if I bring some of these branches over. Because remember, we got to bring branches going out this way, out this way, but then also coming right at us and going away from us. And the ones that are coming right at us, those are the ones that will hide the trunk. And I could still go back in and put some more yellows. I'll put some more detail in these splotches. The more detail and texture I put in it, the closer it's going to look to us. Only because uh, it will have uh, just a, 
more eye grabbing ability versus the soft colors out here. This will be the last one I think I'm going to put in. And then we'll be having the yellowish ones down in here. Go back to a little bit lighter green. There's a pretty big group of them here. So I'll flood this out and go back in with darker colors. And then like I said, just using the tip, whether I push it sideways, up or down, left or right, I'll get all kind of different shapes just with that one brush and that's what I want. And then some of these right in here, I could start right in here and then pull out. These will be the ones that are on the back side of the trunk. So once I put my trunk in here, then they will be hiding the branches that I'm putting in now. That's it. I'm going to drop some darker greens in right here while this is wet, just to start it. And this could even still go darker. If I go any darker than this, I'll start mixing my French Ultramarine Blue with my Brown Matter, and I'll get warm or cool grays that will be pretty dark. Okay, and we gotta wait till that dries before we put our trunk in and it'll run pretty good. I'm gonna go back in and put a little wee bit more texture right in here. Then this could get pretty dark. And then I'll even put some branches in here just from a little bit of trees in the distance. All I'm doing now is just keep on redefining my shapes. And we gotta paint around our highlights and negative areas. I'm barely touching the paper now. Okay, that might be dry enough that I could take some back in. It's a little bit wet, that's okay. I just gotta watch the water. I wanna go back in. I'll rinse out the brush now because I don't want to contaminate my yellow too much. And I'll start from a yellowish green over here to a bluish green over here. Still a little bit too wet. That's our eraser. And again, where I drop the water, it'll only go as far as to where the water was, and it'll stop, just like in digital. Okay, let's dry that, and we'll keep on going. Okay, let's keep on going here. I'll take the brown matter, mix up a darker gray, deep gray. Brown matter and a French ultramarine. A little on a purple side. I'll wait till that dries a little bit and then I'll put a little wee bit more on the left hand side. Just as a subtle shade. Took some of the water out of the brush. I usually just wipe it in my hand make some of these look dead and if I want to give a real subtle hint of the trunk down in here I could do that too it's not in the photo but we'll try it and depending on how much water we have on a brush will determine how much line thickness we'll get may just puddle out and drain or we'll get real nice thin lines there's some nice puddling right in here somewhat drabby lighting in the picture due to the over fog trying to imagine what all my branches are looking like what they're doing in space. And then the finer textures I make 
more subtle shapes I make more contrast more detail snap up the tree a little bit more and then also bring it closer to the viewer we try and do that digitally too here I'm putting down the thalo blue over some white also and you can see it's coming out more blue than green just because I'm not overlapping the yellow I think we'll be okay okay let's stop there and leave all that dry go back clean it up one last time and that might be it okay let's see what else we could do what I want to do is take the rocks just more contrast and some deeper colors only because they're in the foreground and I want them to match how much darkness is in here and how much contrast is in here otherwise they'll start to look unfinished possibly so what I will do is just go back mix up those same colors and just bring a little wee bit more texture out in the patches I already put down I'll just have to be a little bit more specific about that though and again I'm just breaking up some of the edges with water but it'll get more and more complicated looking as I keep on adding texture and the overlapping layers if I wanted to find an edge of a rock if these are growing on top I could just come down right through here make this into a separate rock and then I'll take some more deeper darker lines over that and then we could end up with a script a brush that'll put some grass or something I'll even leave this section white here put some grasses or just small twigs in front of these rocks as long as it's a darker color we could take it back over anything but this is just the mosses that are growing on the rocks but this is just give you a rough idea I mainly used one brush for this whole painting that's something I cannot do with a digital with the exception of the grapes that were done with a round and that was all on one layer but I used blending more than anything that I could put up right now but that's just a speed painting and unfortunately I didn't do any explanation for that one straight blue most of this paint I could reactivate with just a little bit of water okay now we're going to get our script liner it'll be this one right here we're going to put just some real fine grass strokes in the front foreground and that's it okay I think we'll pull out just some highlights just as a demonstration what I'll do is I'll go back in with some gesso I have in a small jar and I'll just run it along the tops of the stones just to define the top edges of them a little bit just to show you how I would pull out some highlights in a traditional watercolor okay here's my gesso I just have it mixed up in a Teflon lid jar what I'll do is I'll just put it down I'll make some water in it and since it's a water-based acrylic it will seal the paper so I wouldn't be able to take anything back over it I'll just like say for example this one right here if I want to just redefine that edge and then just take it back over the colors and I could redefine that edge just a little bit or put some highlights in now if I wanted to put that rime ice in that's how I could do it but I don't think too many folks are familiar with what that is so it might be confusing and then it stops about right in there that doesn't happen too often because usually uh, with fog and then below freezing temperatures 
as the fog moves across the landscape, it sticks to any vertical surfaces and freezes. Putting a little bit more water in the gesso. And we'll put edge right in here. If I want to redefine it, just as an example. And then this could be done in a couple coats also if you want to go more pure white. But it will pick up colors if they're still wet. Gesso is just uh, one of the few colors, shoot, few mediums I should say, that has enough tooth to it that it will allow you to put down one more color on top of it. If you try and put any more than one color on top of it, it will just lift up that color and start moving it around. It won't stay dried because the watercolors are soluble and they'll just loosen up and start moving around. Well, now I think I'm just playing, so I think that's about it. But that's how I would legitimately take highlights back into a watercolor painting, and that is still considered technically a traditional transparent watercolor. Okay, just going to take the tape off and see what we got. And that is it. Now, I could do a couple more things here, make some of these a little bit darker. Uh, maybe pull out just a little wee bit more uh, detail or branch work down in here in these lower pine branches here. And a few other things, but the main point was to just show how much I could do with just one mop squirrel brush. Because even the sky, I could have definitely done it with a mop. It would have just been a bigger mop, that's all. Uh, and then you could barely see the burnt sienna going across the sky. Uh, even though it was really strong uh, when I first put it down and that just goes to show you how much the colors will lighten up uh, as they dry. Okay, we're ready for ABR and PNG. Okay, let's get started. Uh, just bear with me for one moment. I will show you a close-up of that rime ice. This is it right here and the reason why this is important is because the term a photo or a painting is worth a thousand words. This is where it all begins. I take my own photos, I only work for my own photos, and I will have a bunch more photos of this particular area just to remind me that this is rime ice, not frost, not a discoloration in the tree, or anything else. So if I want to try and portray something that it's a foggy day, below freezing, and there's wind involved, that would be one good way of doing it. This right in here is coming across and then it stops right here because it's being protected by the hillside. So for that reason, I only work for my own photographs only because I was there to take them and know what's going on in the photograph. Now, just to show you real quick up close up, this is what it would look like close up. And then you could see that this is all coming from right to left on a different plant, but this is the rime ice. And what it does is it just builds on itself as it keeps on building from the direction it's coming from, but then on the left-hand side of the plant, there's nothing. So it's not frost, so it is something completely different that can further reinforce the information or the story I'm trying to tell in my painting. Okay, let's go on to our brushes. Okay, let's go into our brushes. I'll turn this off and then turn this on. And I just want to go over this quickly. This was from a Rebel 4 demo a long time ago and just so you don't have to review it I'll cover just about all of that information in this one to update it Now these are the ones I used the Windsor Newton 995 They have flat edges on the back just to scrape paper while it's still wet And then that way you could carve out highlights in gobs of color and then the one inch is the one I used for that particular painting, although I probably could have used even a mop for sure. And that is what I used for just about 90% of that painting, uh, just was an Issa Bay mop. And then at the very end, I used a liner, Windsor Newton 859 series, and that just holds a lot of paint and water, but very thin, so you could do a lot of script line work for a long time without reloading. Now, the reason why I want to show you these, it's very important also, and that is ever since I started painting many, many years ago, 
I've been only using a small amount of brushes the whole time. So I am used to doing what I need to do with a limited amount of brushes. I am trying to carry that over into my digital workflow. That is for me only. How many ever brushes you think you need, that is up to you. But unfortunately for me, if I start getting over a hundred or a couple hundred brushes, I will probably forget that I have a brush that does a specific thing and not even know I even have it anymore. So for that reason, I am going to try and show you how to build specific patterns to render objects and or textures in a specific way. And then that's all we need to know for transparent watercolors. Anything above that is up to you. Okay, I'm gonna turn this one off and we'll turn on the traditional watercolor painting. And I'll zoom in just a little bit just to show you. But what I wanna show you though is just some of these patterns that we were trying to create with just a single brush, whether I was scraping the brush sideways, pushing on the bristles, pulling on the bristles, scumbling it around in different shapes with different pressures, I cannot do that digitally. So what I want to do is actually try to recreate those shapes in a digital form. In other words, where I may have had to have touched a brush down here, here, there, 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 here, and here, just to get the shape, I'll just try and recreate that shape all at once in a digital stamp brush. This way, I could still do the odds and ends edges that that type of a brush will create in a traditional form, but we'll be using it in digital. Now, what I wanna be able to do is to just have a randomness to it, just like traditional, which will be our challenge for this type of a brush. Okay, let's move on to some of the brushes and shapes we're gonna be working with. I'll turn this one off, and then I'll turn this one on, and I'm going to open this group up just to show you that all of these individual brushes are all on their own layer. And I have them set up specifically this way for a specific reason. And that is, if I want to drag this brush down here and then copy it over, duplicate it, flop it, flip it, erase some areas, or add it to another shape and pull that one down here, then I can even make another brush shape on top of the ones I got just by combining these. Because keep in mind, when we go into our brush creator, we will have a total of four that we'll be able to use. So if you start combining any of these two, then technically you're kind of using five shapes instead of only four. But then also, we could easily use one of these shapes as the grain also. So if we want to just stack them and use all four of these to get our final result, that's what we could do. Because again, I just want to look for specific patterns that are non-repetitive and look random in the end result of what our brush will do. Let's go on to see how we're going to do this. Okay, now again, these are all PNGs, so if you find PNGs that you're happy with and you wanna use them as is, you can, and you could uh, be ready to work from there. But if you want to try to use ABR brushes or ABR sets, more importantly, if you find a whole set of brushes you'd like to use, but we can't use them in Rebel as an ABR, we can actually use it as a PNG, and that would be right here. I will turn this one off, turn this one on. Now, this is a screen capture of what the program looks like. Now, we're gonna go over the actual program here right away in a moment, but I want to let you know something very important. One is this right here, splash screen comes up. Every time you open it, say no thanks, always. And the reason why is this visit texturemate.com, that particular website doesn't even exist anymore. It's some kind of a gambling site or something. So I would just stay away from it. But otherwise, if you do download a safe program, it should be okay. It's just called ABR Mate 1.1. If you want to research a download link yourself, by all means, look for a safe download if you have a place you can get your downloads from. I'll put one down from Softpedia. That is the safest place I know of, but I got mine from somewhere else that I can't even remember. And again, if you go to Softpedia, be careful. No matter what you download, those things change, come and go and just run an antivirus on it or anything you can 
uh, to prevent uh, running into troubles from a download. Now I will close this out. And now what we're gonna do is open up the actual program. Here it is right here. And again, it's very straightforward. It's just open up any brush set, open up all brush sets in a folder. So you can even open up a folder at a time that has more than one ABR, which can include more than one ABR brush in each ABR file. So just say, for example, I wanna open up one brush set. I'll click on that. Now here's the one I have ready. It's just watercolor artist brush. This is what it looks like as an ABR file because I use Affinity Photo 2 uh, for my ABR files, but then it's just one big file. Now, if I click on that and open it, there it is. Now it's all open. This is the brushes that particular ABR file contained, different watercolor brushes that I may be able to use or add to other ones if I want a more complex look. So all I have to do is go right down here and it just says right here, export selected brushes to PNG, export all open brushes to PNGs, uh, or export all preview panel PNG. Now what I will do is export all open brushes to PNGs. I click on that. Now I'll go up to my uh, desktop right here, uh, home. And this is where I had the original from ABR to PNG. Click on that, hit OK. And that's it, it's working down here, and that's all. Now, if I go back to that same file that I opened up this original watercolor artist brushes ABR, this is what the original file looked like. Now it extracted all of these PNG files out of this particular ABR file. So now I would be able to take these PNG files and uh, use them in Rebel as they are and how we're going to put these multiple shape patterns together to create a random watercolor brush. Let's begin. Okay, first we need to, I will close those out. And first we need to go to our 3D illustration. This was recycled uh, from the previous demonstration I gave way back in Rebel 4. This is very important though. This will give us a rough idea how we are going to get the shapes we get and the brush pattern we get depending on how our shapes overlap each other. Now this right in here is the numbers game. Uh, it is all the technical info of why you get what you get. But this is the easiest way right here. Basic way to remember any value of gray supersedes white and any black, solid black, supersedes any value of gray. So in other words, the white is what will print. So if I have this white splat right here, which is this image right here on top, and then this soft edge circle, which is the middle layer, and then this down here is the grain, which is right here, the pebble finished grain, so to speak. When you combine all three of these together, this is what you get. Now what we are getting is anywhere this red line is going through all white. White here, white here, solid white here, and then a solid white dot in the grain. So you are going to get that white dot. That is what you're getting when all the whites line up. But now, however, you have the splat on top, this splat right here. But if you put a soft edged circle under it or over it, then what will happen is you will get the splat, but the outside edge of the splat starts to soften and turns into medium grays, which will be only a smaller percentage of the opacity that you're using. Anything that's pure white, it will be the 100% opacity that you have selected. Anything that starts to go off with gray will only be a smaller percentage depending on the intensity of the gray. So again, the pebble finish down here is this pebble finish in the middle, but your overall shape was the splat, but the rounded soft edge circle changed that and made the outer splats a little bit lighter in value compared to the center. And this is how we will get 
our shapes when we start lining up all these different watercolor brush strokes this will give us a rough idea that if we want a random edge if we want some areas to soften uh, darken in anything in between let's go ahead and start creating some brushes okay I'll close this out I'll shrink that down and then what we'll do is I have create number one that's the one we will use to start it but we can even turn on our brushes right here and then we'll use these brush shapes from our drop down group and then also what we'll do is start making our own what we'll do first is create our own brush shapes out of given ones we've downloaded whether they be PNG or ABR that's up to you but we'll create a couple of brushes in Rebel that will work as a random watercolor brush and then we'll go on to create our own watercolor splash uh, drips uh, swooshes whatever you want to call them and we'll do that last okay let's just go over a few basic settings we're going to leave as is the whole time we're creating our brushes this is what I do when I also make any brush for myself the absorbency, rewet, texture influence, edge darkening, diffusion speed. These are all under visual settings. That would be the window right here. And then there would be right here visual settings, which is either F12 or just click right here in the window drop down. And then we will leave these all at fives straight down. No drips, no granulation. And then the canvas visibility, uh, no nanopixel. We don't need that right now. And then the paper texture and the paint texture we will also leave at fives. These will stay like they are th the rest of the demo. And then also when I go to the watercolor brushes, I do not want any water at all. The water will change the brush quite a bit. I want to see what kind of patterns I'm laying down first because I don't want any repetitive patterns. I have to do what I need to do to get a very random shape with the brushes I'm going to create. Okay, that's just all the settings. Uh, we'll go over a few settings when we start creating the brushes, but the background and, and uh, visual and brush settings, that's where they will stay. Let's go ahead and start creating some brushes. Okay, let's create a quick grain. And what I wanna do is show you, I will go back to the watercolor brushes, select one, and this is the one that we're going to create. You probably noticed that. All it is is a gradation. Now what I want to show you is just to how to do that. Go up to our selection tool and or marquee tool. I'm going to come down here and start drawing. And I'm holding the shift key down. So I make a perfect square. Enter that. And then in Rebel 7, we will go up to the fill bucket and grab the gradient tool. And right now what we need to do is grab the black marker and make it 25 and then the white marker make it 75 and this will be just a, a little bit more abrupt of a gradient instead of a real slow gradient it'll be a little bit quicker and that's what we want so now if I take my fill bucket and make the gradient I'll make it straight across and just leave it there enter that and that's it that's our gradient now, to get that up into our image library, all I have to do is hit this button right here, and that is to import the selection. And if I click on that, there it is right here. Now, I only need one of these, which is right here. And for that reason, I will go ahead and delete this one and undo how I made it. And then what we're going to do is go over what we could do with this type of a grain. It is very useful for what we're doing now with our brushes, but you also may be able to use it with other brushes for other reasons. Let's do that next. Okay, now let's just grab a just a typical brush. This one has four shapes in it. I want to start you off with just one shape, and then the grain itself will use that gradation, but I'll show you a couple of different things here. Now, we don't want any tilt, no water. We're just going to use it as paint. And then we're going to go back to stroke. I don't want any spacing, spacing, gender, or scatter. The size and jitter and opacity is irrelevant. 
but we go back to shape and grain i want follow trajectory and this is going to be just a typical brush stroke with this particular shape right here and if i do that just remember that the left side of the shape is will always be the leading edge of the brush with follow trajectory so in other words if i start putting down let's go back to our create if i put down a shape you can see how this little section right here in the shape will always stay at the trailing edge of the brush. Now what's happening is I'm getting some fuzzies on the top because of the gradation. Remember, white prints. So where this white here overlaps this white here, then that is what will print just like in our 3D illustration uh, from previously in the demo. But now the bottom, the black does not print. So where it starts to gradate, our shape on the bottom will start to fade out. Now to verify that, what we could do is start to put spacing in it. I'll get rid of that. I'll close this out. And then what I will do is go back to the stroke and add some spacing. And then if I go back to the shape now, what should happen is the bottom of the shape should gradate off to nothing. And there it is. The bottom of the shape is now just fading off into the paper. So if I take my grain and flop it the whole way around, now the top of the shape should fade off. And that's exactly what's happening. So with that in mind, we're going to use that to our benefit to create lighter areas within the same brush stroke just by spinning these around and making some changes so when we make a brush mark what will happen is we'll get light and dark values within that same brush stroke now this is what i want as far as just for watercolors try to keep it as simple as possible there are many other variations adjustments we could do but we don't need to not for this set of brushes now, what I want to do also show you then too, that because we could use it as a gradation, I used to take my grasses and my, my shrubs, trees, stamps, and then gradate them on the bottom when I'd make it. But you don't really have to do that if you have a gradated grain. Then any shape you use will gradate on the side that you have the grain set at. This way, if you want to use a shape that'll gradate into the background, if just say, for example, you want to make a flower stamp, but you want the stem to gradate into the vegetation that's around it, then you could use your gradated grain. Now, let's go in and make some more complicated brushes that will have multiple stamps and the, the uh, regular grain and also the uh, gradated grain uh, to give us the kind of end result we want for a randomized watercolor stroke. Okay, let's get started here. Now, what I want to do first, I'll turn this one off. Just go to a new layer that we could paint on. And then what I want to show you, though, is just I went ahead and made a, a basic sample right here of just three shapes and two different grains. Now, the, the grains are just the gradated gradient going from complete white to pure black, just inverted. And I will show you, there is the first shape, but then here is the second grain. So again, you can see they're just inverted. And then going back to the first shape, this is the first shape here. Then this is the second shape. And then I scroll through the gradient and get to the third shape. That is the shapes we're using. Now, what I want to show you, though, is the most important for this particular brush is that we have it on random. And that is that it'll randomize the grains and the shapes, and that is what we want. Because when I make a simple brush stroke, uh, let's go with uh, let's go with uh, Prussian blue, and it as big as I can. I'll leave it with no water on the first one, and this is what we would get with this particular brush stroke. And you could see that now without no water. It's, it's just going to give me the stamp marks that I want that I'm looking for. So for that reason, get my arrow here. Up here is gradated. Down here is gradated. Up here is gradated. Down here is gradated. 
down here is gradated, up here is gradated, and up here is gradated, and then we go back down to gradated on the bottom. That is giving me exactly what I want, only because it's randomizing everything, which is something I want, but it's also randomizing the gradation, and I'll show you why that's important. Now here is what I'm looking for. If I go to make some marks, now this is without any water at all, I want to be able to make a random mark like this, and then what I'm looking for is light opacity areas within this mark. This is the overall paintbrush stroke we made, so to speak, and what I'm looking for is dark areas such as this. Let's get our pointer out. dark areas such as this, and then lighter areas where the gradations are working, right here, right here, within, and then I'm even getting soft edges on the outer perimeter, and that's what I want also. I want this as random as possible, because then I know when I add water to this, this is what will happen. I'll put a little bit of water to it, and then now if I do the same thing, and I could stop it anywhere I want, that is a nice splotch that remember, I want to try and duplicate uh, this right here. When I went back to the traditional painting now, right here, these are the shapes I'm trying to create. Now I scumbled in these shapes just with one brush and just got all kind of random shapes, but then built up those layers also and created a different shapes by combining multiple layers on the same paper. This is what I want to do with the digital brush that this is how I could duplicate that effect but what just with one brush stroke that now I'm getting a, a random perimeter but this is what I got to watch for some of these shapes that are coming out they're duplicating themselves too much and this is the part I mentioned that I want to correct I want to either what I will do is take this brush stroke up here and maybe try to overlap it with another brush stroke in a way that it camouflages these strokes right here a little bit more because when you see a specific pattern like that and it constantly keeps on showing up it's okay if it looks random like just brush strokes like you painted back and forth but if it's the exact same shape that keeps on reproducing itself then that's going to be an eye grabber in a bad way so with that in mind if i see some of these that are being diffused because of the water, then that's okay. Then I could count on the water to camouflage some of the shapes for me so they don't look identical. But in other cases, I may have to redo that shape in a way that it doesn't keep on reproducing itself over and over in the outside of the perimeter or within the brush stroke. Let's try and do that next. Okay, now we got an idea of what we're looking for. Let's see if we could put a couple of these together and just disguise some of the edges a little bit better. And what I'll do is turn this one off, go to a new layer, and then let's grab this one up here. I'll control shift, left click, and that is this one right here. Now I will right click on the layer, duplicate that one, and we will leave it right there. Grab my move tool, pull it down here, and we'll work on this one right here. Now let's use this one right here. This one has a lot of nice soft edges going around. And then I could try and tuck this part of it right here into somewhere in here. I'll show you what I mean. We'll hit OK. And now this one should be number two. So we'll just go ahead. Yes, it is. We will duplicate that one. And then now we'll take the duplicate and move it up to the other one. Put them side by side in case we want to merge them together or keep them in a group because again we could always go back in and change things around if we try the brush and it's still not quite what we're looking for now let's zoom in a little bit now and i'm going to turn this one around let's see I'm trying to imagine what i'm going to get here i don't like this square right here that's a little bit too pronounced too so in other words what I can do even now is just take the eraser to some of this and I'm going to build it up so it pretty much ends up as a square again and I'll leave that one there and then what we'll do is let's see what other one we could use let's try this one right here 
that is this one right here I will duplicate that one and we will move the copy up here with the other copies get our move tool move this one down now let's see what we could do with all of this and we want to lighten now what we could do is if some of these I could disguise that square right there now what we could do with all of these is lighten them all up if we still want some transparent areas or just light opacity areas within that now, I don't like this square edge here too right here this edge right here so we're gonna do some things here let's turn it around this way I'll try that right there and then what I'm gonna do is go back in and lighten up each layer let it all build up one last one right there I'll make this one 80 and this one I'll take that one up to 90 looks like this one's too light we'll make this one let's go with about 75 okay let's take a look and see what's going on here now I adjusted these just the way I did but if you look and start really studying what we're doing here I could already see some straight lines parallel lines are really dangerous uh, especially in any kind of design only because they create like what would be considered a flat wall in other words converging lines would be considered like railroad tracks they have a direction parallel lines it's just like a flat wall just stops you that's it but in this case those parallel lines could be very well a, a redundant shape again so I think I'd want to destroy those let's go up to our eraser and I'm gonna pick a nondescript now let's just go with this one right here and I'm gonna turn the opacity up okay and then we're gonna try and just just break up some of these I'm gonna to go to the middle one I think yeah that is it and I'm just going to just try to just take some of this line out just to use real fine spots just to try and create another texture and then I am going to go to I think number three yes and I'm going to take a little bit of this out and I want to remove this straight edge right here and I'm going to try these uh, real fine dots splatter just to erase with I want to see what kind of effect I get because remember we do something like this and we create a real strong subtle texture will disappear and slowly smooth out if we add water to it because then the water is just going to rush all the paint together and it's going to fill in where those holes are now I could also do that with the this one right here and just get rid of some of these just a little bit there we go and I can even have turned the opacity down a little bit with this eraser and just try to change things just a little bit and again like I said I'll be looking to see what happens I want to get rid of that square wherever it is and that's it right there there we go now it'll blend right into the one below it now this one is a pretty decent nondescript shape the reason why is these right here these right here aren't too bad at all uh, they're fairly if they stuck way out then that's going to be the eye grabber but they're kind of tucked back in and then anything else that if it's not a real obvious shape so to speak then I will go with this one now let's stay with this one here and we're going to try it now what I'll do first is I want to put that into a group and then I'm going to just hit control G and I'm going to save that one the way it is and we'll just call it a uh, sample okay and then now I can open it up to see what we're working on and even these dots might be a little bit too bright now I could either take them let's just take them out I don't think they're doing enough okay I'll pick that one and then we're going to go back over it again with the eraser just to lighten them up a little bit just like that there we go just to get rid of a, a specific pattern and because if they're real light in opacity they're not going to be an eye grabber then now that's an interesting splotch there we're going to save that one as it is I'll back this off and then again if I was doing this for myself I would want to what I'll do is select all three of them and then hit my move tool and then I will just move these up into here and consider this a completed brush and then hit OK 
and then I would save my rebel file just as is. So let's do that for now, and then we'll see what kind of a pattern this one gives us. Now remember, we could add this one to any of the other ones that are up here, or any of the other ones that we may have. And in some case, it may be good just by itself the way it is. Let's try and see what it looks like. Okay, now that we've got our three layers in place, now that I have them all selected, I'm just going to duplicate all three of them. And then now that those three copies are selected still, I'm going to merge those together. And then here is, if I turn these off, and then there's the final one. Now this is all three of them together. So I'll just put down brush. And that's all three copies together. But then now what I could do is go up and get my selection tool, draw a nice square around it, all right there. That don't look too bad right there and then go up open this up and click on this I have to go back to my watercolor brushes first now I'm going to duplicate this brush first duplicate brush preset and I'll put the new one in that we'll leave the old one just as is and this is the one I wanted to replace anyway so now first I'm going to import this one in here it is now and then that's what it looks like it doesn't look too bad at all now I'll even just leave that one there with all of the other ones and then see what we get with that one. Now this one's a little bit strong too. It has a very specific pattern on the top. So let's change that one. Uh, let's go to, let's see, let's try this one right here and then we'll try that combination and we'll close this up just to give us more room and I'll unselect and then I will go to the top and we'll try and paint with this now the new setup and we'll add some water to this and let the water do its thing and then now do we see anything Now see here's that one droplet right here that keeps on repeating itself and it's a very specific distance from from its uh, neighboring shape so that's what would bother me but you're getting a lot of nice uh, just these don't bother me this one's okay these are okay but just that drop, so I'd even go back in and take that drop out. And, and then that might be a pretty decent brush because you could see how many odds and ends organic shapes we're getting. And some drops here and there aren't too bad at all. So let's go back in and take that drop out just to see if that makes a difference. Okay, now here's the first thing we could try. We go back to that shape, and that was this one right here. So we'll go back to it, find it, there it is. Now what we could try and do is just turn it around a little bit. Let's first turn it, uh, let's just try that and then see how it lines up there. That is even kind of making it worse because now we have multiple places where that pattern is coming out a little bit too pronounced. So let me turn it two more times and then that will be completely different there. And that's still giving us some problems with that same drip. So what I would have to do is go back in and I would actually eliminate this shape. But then what I would do is go back to this shape here and take these drips out. Just that one drip here, this drip here. So what I could do is I will turn that off and I will grab this one. And that's this one right here. And then duplicate it. Pull it down here. And then now I would get my erase tool again. And I would get rid of this one. Let's take it all the way up and just get rid of it. And this one. And then these two here too. And then let's see what else we could do with that one. I think maybe if we even took that over again. Let me double this one. And just set it up. And see if we could just move it around. Uh, it's, it's going to create even a more specific pattern by the looks of it. Uh, I could see an X here now, and that would be uh, very distracting in my opinion. But let's see if we could lighten one of these layers up. Now that's a little bit better. But this is uh, some very specific shapes that might not work. You know what, let's put that one aside. And let's even just go back in and grab another shape to see if we could make that better. And here, let's see, and we'll grab, oh, we got to go back to our watercolor brushes first. Okay, we'll go back to the watercolor brushes. And then here it is here. Now, I like the shape we just made over here. But we'll see if we could find another one. 
I'm going to take this one out and we'll try this. That's interesting there. Uh, that is with water. Here's without. I'll get the same hook shape right here that's repeating itself, but that's not as bad. Even if that's, you can see where it's, it's getting lighter, darker because of the gradient grains. But then you can see how splotchy this is with water, and that is a very nice ragged edge that's uh, pretty nondescript. Uh, if we put some more color into it, let's go with uh, permanent magenta. Yeah, that's not bad there. I think I'd hang on to this one. Now what I'll do is just go up. This one is irrelevant. This one we're not using at all. And then this one I just made, put together, it is the copy, sample two. But what I would do now though is because I like everything the way it is, just very basic setups, no curves, no anything. It's just overlapping with the two different grains that are opposing gradients. I would then hit this middle button right here and that will keep that brush settings as the default and that's it I got my new brush so now let's try that brush with a little bit more and I would keep this one this shape here too as is I really like that one the way it's working and I'm going to probably eliminate this one here let's try and see how that brush works next okay let's see what this new brush could do the only thing I did was uh, save it right here save volumes and paint mode into brush preset I like to save it all with just paint because with watercolors I don't use the paint and mix or the paint and blend uh, otherwise I let the water do the work for me and then I will occasionally do blend and that is just to scrub out some uh, maybe some edges or some shapes that I don't want and I have that set up as my back rocker on my pen so I could immediately go to blend when I'm ready to blend now in this particular case I'm just gonna make uh, I don't want any directions uh, everything is just straight up the way it should be a straightforward brush and I want to see what it'll do and that's not bad at all uh, that has uh, some natural looks to it that it's an irregular shape but then it has some shapes inside of it so I could technically use it as is if I would want to do any kind of distant brush different things how can I build up and use this shape and this pattern that it's creating and in other words let's see now if we add a little bit of water to it then if I start doing this again then now what I could do is then I have a nice erratic edge perimeter looks pretty good but then I'm also getting different values within that shape and that's you can see where the let's try it there that's not bad you can see where the uh, opposing gradients uh, are, are really kicking in here and there and uh, what will happen though is because I don't have no tilt on the water will go in all directions so if there is a soft area because of the gradation it could fill in pretty quick if I let the water move too uh, fast. Uh, let's turn this one off and make a new one. And okay, now let's try. Now let's see if we could just uh, go over anything. What I might want to do is just have a little bit more scatter. Let's try a little bit more scatter right here. And what that'll do is if I get too much, I could turn it back. What that's going to do is just throw out the stamp shapes to the left and right of my brush stroke and that would even give me a more erratic perimeter that's not bad there now with the water it's going to you can see how some of the lighter areas are inside but then that is a very interesting perimeter and I have the opacity fairly down now let's put the, some raw umber in that get some grays and then I'm, I'm keeping the same diffused in some places hard edges in others but then i only have the opacity at 50 let's turn it all the way up put down some raw umber and then some cobalt blue and see what we get there these little scribbles in here are really nice and this one little swoosh if it's the only one there then it's not going to bother me but if i see that same swoosh here 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 then that's going to be troubles because in traditional, it's just really, really, really difficult to make an exact brush uh, mark uh, twice. 
the exact same way. Okay, I'll fast dry it there. And then now if I even dry the layer completely, it is dry. I take colors back over them even with water. They're not going to lift up the blue and I should not get any re-wet because the layer is considered dry. Let's see what it does. See, now that the paper is dry, even though it's on blue that I already painted, then this is the kind of things I would be looking for, that what's happening is the permanent magenta is staying right where it's at, and it's giving me hard straight edges, but then I could see right in here, right in here, this is interesting that this is very soft and diffusing out when I have hard edges over here. Uh, so I'm getting very unusual shapes and that are not working with the blue at all because I dried the paper. So this is what I would be looking for. Uh, this is how I would be able to actually uh, create or duplicate some of the shapes I got on the boulders and rocks in the traditional painting. I would definitely keep this brush as is and could either build off of it or make variations of it. Uh, that would work really good too. Once you start finding some brushes you like, then you could start combining them or even just figure out what you did to create a brush that you like. Now, I hope you picked up something in this particular demo. Uh, again, uh, please hit that like or subscribe if you find something you like. And as I always say, until I see you out in the field or back at the studio, thanks for watching.